Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that name Jesus Jesus oh Jesus there's just something about that name Master Savior Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus, my Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim kings and kingdoms will all pass away but there's something about that name
told you you're not good enough when he told you you're not right when he told you you're not strong enough to put up a good fight when he told you you're not worthy when he told you you're not loved when he told you you're not beautiful that you'll never be enough He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. He will rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fear in the fire. Fear, he is a liar. When he told you you were troubled, you'll forever be alone. When he told you you should run away, you'll never find a home. When he told you you were dirty, you should be ashamed. <clears throat> When he told you you could be the one that grace could never change. Fear, he is a liar. He will take your breath, stop you in your steps. Fear, he is a liar. your fear in the fire cause fear he is a liar let your fire fall and cast out all my fears let your fire fall your love is all I feel let your fire fall and cast out Steps. Fear, he is a 
us fear, he is a liar. For the boys Sunday school class will come up for their special. Jesus blinded all my darkness, he sparked my heart within, his grace and mercy lit a passion, consumed my sin.
go to service. We took up time. Yeah. I'll sing another song. Okay. Let's turn to page 43, sing Come and Die. has a table spread where the saints of God are fed. He invites his chosen people come and dine. With his manna he doth feed and supplies our every need. Oh, tis sweet to sup with Jesus all the time. So come and dine, the master call it come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call it now, come and die. The disciples came to land, thus obeying Christ's command. For the master called to them, come and die. There they found their heart's desire, bread and fish upon the as he satisfies the hungry every time. So come and dine, the master call it, come and dine. You may feast at Jesus' table all the time. He who fed the multitude turned the water into wine. To the hungry call it, come and dine. I am thinking of How will shout and how will sing, Lord, Lord, when the redeemed are gathering in? There will be a great procession over on the streets of gold when the redeemed are gathering in. Oh, what music, oh, what singing, all oh, the city will be rolled when the snow and free from all sin. How will shout and how will sing when the redeemed are gathering in. Saints will sing redemption story with their voices clear and strong when the redeemed are gathering in. Then the angels all will listen for cannot join that song when the redeemed are gathering in. Oh, when the redeemed are gathering in, watch like snow and free from all sin. How will shine When the redeemed gathering in, I like that part where it says the angels all will listen. Well, they cannot join this song. They weren't redeemed. They were not redeemed. We were redeemed. So we can sing redemption story and they have to be quiet. Heaven has to be silent. 
when they're redeemed, but now we won't. But heaven will be silent, but the bride will not be silent. I promise you, we'll make a lot of noise, and that's okay with me. So God bless you. Good to be here. Sister Rachel. Who? Oh, well, we can do that. Sit back down. Sit back down. Huh? Huh? We'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow? We'll stand back up. Hiya, hiya, hiya. Lift it up. Anyway. And then, then, then one, of the, one of the Watkins girls is going to sing tomorrow, too. The one that's, yes, you are. Yes, ma'am, you are. Yeah, you are. You show up tomorrow, you're going to sing. Your daddy's already said you're going to sing, so daddy knows best. But good to have them with us today, and good to have Brother Matthew Watkins. It's been a lot. I think the last time he was here, the girls weren't even born. So he's got a lot more gray hair than the last time I met him. So he blames it on the girls. So why do people always blame it on the girls? It's the boys most of the time that gives you the problems, you know. Amen. And the man said, and the women said, amen. So let's sing open the eyes of my heart as Brother Matthew Watkins comes from Beaufort, South Carolina. We, like I said, we hadn't had him in a while, and it's really exciting to, to uh, be here today and, and hear what the Lord's got to have for us. And then tomorrow, same time, we'll have service tomorrow in the morning starting at 945. Uh, Brother Bob will be doing Sunday school, and then Brother Matthew will be bringing the word, and then we'll not have a second service so everybody can fellowship together and everybody can get back home and not be so late. So let's sing Open the Eyes of My Heart. As our brother comes. Eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see you. Jesus, a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to see him. Amen. You love him tonight. Amen. God bless you. Certainly a privilege to be here with you. Amen. And it's been a little while, as Brother Wade said, <clears throat> since we were here last, but certainly want to uh, say it's a privilege, count it an honor for uh, Brother Wade to invite us. Appreciate Brother Sam. Amen. Good to see him, Brother Samuel, here tonight. And and it's been a little while, and a lot of water, and a lot of time has went by, a lot of water under the bridge, but God has been faithful throughout all of it, from the, from the past to the present, and He'll be faithful tomorrow. How will He be faithful? How do we know He'll be faithful to us tomorrow? Because He was faithful yesterday. He's faithful today, and he's unchanging. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we want to invite you to the Word tonight, Judges chapter 13. This afternoon, I should say, a little bit <clears throat> in the middle of the day here, Judges chapter 13, and we'll just take a text here. Can I move this to the side, by the way, or just move it just up? That's all right. All right. Judges chapter 13. Amen. We bring greetings from uh, South Carolina and uh, from my father, Brother Jason Watkins, pastor there, and, and uh, bring greetings from the church there. And I'm just grateful to speak to you, to the young people here tonight. Good to see all of you 
um, that have came. I don't know if you're just all from here or maybe different places. I know we got to see a lot of the youth here at our uh, youth camp. How many was at our youth camp there in uh, South Carolina? Good. Got a big number of you. Amen. Well, we certainly had a good time, and I just trust that there's still something burning in your heart, amen, from what the Lord has done, but you've continued to let whatever God did for you grow in your life, amen. It doesn't mean between then and now that you haven't made any mistakes or you haven't fallen or maybe you feel backwards or you've went the other way, amen. But you know what? The Lord Jesus is mindful of you tonight. He's mindful of each and every single one of your needs, and and I believe that today is not just, Brother Wade said you do this every, I think, every other month, and but tonight uh, is not just another every other month service, but we're in the presence of the Lord, Amen. and so anything is possible, Amen. and God knows, God knows why you came. He knows the motive. I don't know. I don't even know most of you. God knows the motive and the intention of your heart. He knows why you're gathered here. He knows what thoughts are going through your mind right now. And so I just invite you to center your mind and focus your attention on what the Lord has and say, Lord, would you come and specifically speak to me? Amen. And to my situation, how many could raise a hand and say, Lord, I have a need upon my heart. I want you to come and meet that expectation. Amen. Brother Louise, good to see you there. I see you there in the back. Amen. God bless you. Judges chapter 13. We just want to uh, go straight to the word. And it is have something upon my heart, praying, uh, knowing, leading up to this meeting that would come. I've just been praying and asked the Lord what direction it had me go, and I was just in many different uh, directions, but the Lord has just brought our thoughts to judges, and I'd just like to uh, minister this tonight to the youth and to all those that are here, and then um, and then tomorrow, Lord willing, we'll just continue in that same, amen, thought, Brother Bob, good to see you also, all the ministers and different ones here, amen, familiar faces, I believe that uh, I'm thankful for this church, thankful for the lighthouse that it's been for many years, and the ministries, and the teaching gifts, and, and so I'm not a teacher like Brother Wade, um, I, I'm an evangelist, and I've got, I've actually got a card in my wallet, and I've got a license to prove it, and so I brought my evangelistic, my evangelist card tonight, and so um, that's what we're going to do. We're going to preach the word, amen. I believe that there's power in the presence of God, and when Jesus is near, Satan will fight you the hardest to keep your attention and focused on the word of God. When Jesus is the closest, Satan fights the hardest, and so I believe that if what we have to say to you tonight is truth and it could bring freedom, then you just push back every spirit, say, Lord, drive back any spirit of unbelief or doubt or curiosity or attention, whatever it is I have my mind on. Let me center on what you want to say tonight. Amen. I'd like to speak to you on the value of the spirit, the value of the spirit. And the children of Israel, let's just begin reading here at verse, uh, let's just begin actually reading at verse 3 in Judges 13. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto the woman. And said unto her, Behold, now thou art barren. Now she was a type of Israel. Israel was quite barren, quite backslid. Uh, in the book of Judges, we find that there's an entire generation that raises up that doesn't know the Lord uh, like their fathers and the God of their fathers. And so God, the Bible says, raised up judges uh, to, to, to deliver the people. And so th she's a type of, of the condition of all of Israel, that she's barren and there's no fruit coming from her life. But he says here in verse 3, Behold, now thou art barren and bearest not, but thou shalt conceive and bear a son. Now therefore, Beware, I pray thee, and drink not wine, nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son, and no razor shall come. Notice this. Now no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite unto God from the womb. Now that he's not even born yet. He's not breathed his first breath. But already there's a purpose that, that is working in Samson's life before he even comes to the world. There's already a purpose. 
There's already a plan. There's already a blueprint. Young people, there's already, before you came here in 2022 and we're here in March, and there's a lot happening in your life, there's a lot happening locally, a lot maybe in your church, maybe in the world, in the entire grand scheme of things. But let me just tell you this. Don't ever lose sight of the fact that before you were even born, God already had a purpose, a design for your specific life. But just like God had, a, God had a plan, Satan also has a plan and a purpose for your life. And so notice here, even before he breathes, before he comes, God's already said he's going to be a Nazarite unto God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came unto me. His countenance was like the countenance of an angel, very terrible, means very awesome. But I asked him not whence he was, neither told me his name. And he said, Behold, thou shalt conceive, bear a son. And she repeats what the angel have said. But notice what she says here. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, to the day of his death. So in other words, no matter, this is before Samson made a wrong choice or the right choice. And God said, this is, this is what I'm going to have a purpose upon the life of this man. And no matter where he goes or what he does, that purpose will follow him from the first breath unto the last breath. Now that does not mean that Samson will ever fall into the purpose or the will of God for his life. He may never yield to that. And we find out ultimately his life never really yields. The saddest part of Samson, the saddest part of the story of Samson is not a man who we find bound and blind led by a child. But the, the saddest part of Samson's life was that it was a life that God had purposed, but he never realized the purpose that God had for him. He says here, and he shall be unto the day of his death. Then Manoah treated the Lord. Lord, let the man of God who did sin come again and teach us. Now, let's move on just a little bit past this. And God hearkened unto the voice of Manoah. Verse 9, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Let's just move on to verse 1 of chapter 14. Let's just look over so that we can save some time. Verse 1 of chapter 14, and Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters <coughs> of the Israelites. Oh, sorry. Did I read that wrong? Oh, young people, did I read that wrong? He saw, let's read it again. Maybe y'all blinked and you didn't see that or don't, don't let me sneak a fast one on you. And Samson went down to Timnath and saw a woman in Timnath of the daughters of the Israelites. No, that's not what it says. He saw a woman of the daughters of the Philistines. And he says, and he came up and told his father, I have seen a woman in Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me to wife. Could you imagine talking to your mom that way, young man? I like her. I want it. Now get it. <laughs> and he says, now therefore get her for me to wife. Then his father and his mother said, is there never a woman among the daughters of thy brethren or among all my people that thou goest to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistine? And Samson said unto his father, get her for me for she pleaseth me well. This is what's amazing. Verse four, but his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord. It's amazing how sometimes, listen to me, parents, because I know some of you are here. It's amazing how sometimes how we view something so black and white, and yet God's maybe looking at it in a different way than what you are. His father and mother knew not that it was of the Lord, that he sought an occasion against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Let's just bow our heads Amen. We'll just have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we just ask for your divine presence, Lord, to come into this building. Lord, we've already read your word, so there's already a blessing that's upon our life just from reading it. Lord, but we believe that preaching of the word drives back evil spirits. Lord, and I pray, God, that right now you'd come and take the promises that you've given us out of your word. Make them a living reality in the, every person that's here. Lord, I humble myself now to your spirit. Lord, not coming with any 
certain agenda, any kind of specific thought, Lord, other than just to be a servant to be used. Now, Lord, I'll speak to these those that are here. I don't know many of them, Lord, but I believe that you do. I believe that you're here in this building tonight and that you've gathered us here for a special purpose. Lord, and I may speak things here, and Lord, and if, and if it's just me who speaks, Father, maybe if we were to go six or seven weeks down the road, maybe all the young people would even struggle to remember what I spoke on or even the scripture I, I took, Lord, for that's the, that's the shallowness of the word of man. Lord, but if you would come and speak a word tonight, and if your voice would speak to the heart of maybe one, maybe two of your people, Lord, then it would have an eternal impact that would never leave. Not even death could take that away from them. So we just raise our hands. I raise mine with every person here in a sign of surrender and say, Lord, we surrender to your spirit. May you come and take your word, Lord, and break the word of life to your family. For I believe that's who I'm speaking to tonight. Bless us now, one and all, we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> Just keep your Bible open there to Judges, book of Judges. Just stay there in chapter 14. Preaching to you on the value of the Spirit, the value of the Spirit. It's amazing when you look at life and the Bible has a way of making it very 3D. You can read the Psalms of David and you get more than just the, just the uh, you know, uh, uh, references to doctrinal things, but you get a, a real life that you can relate to as a, as a real person because David lived a life that was very real and it, well, there was no pretense and no facade, but he spoke of things that you could really relate to. And the Bible's filled with characters. Brother Branham said, you find you a character in the Bible and find someone there and identify yourself there in the word because God's not a respecter of persons. Can you say amen? And so, so the, 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 the scripture, David speaks of life as a journey and, and the Bible types it as a journey and, a, and, it's, and it's amazing because uh, you look through, uh, through, through the entire uh, word of God and what you'll find is, is that these were lives of men and you can read some of them very detailed from the time they were young and David is, is a young man all the way to the age where he's an aged man as a king and he goes off the scene and then you see his entire, all the ebbs and flows of David's life and you read the good times and you could look at the bad times and you could look at the times when maybe David was on fire for the Lord and then other times when he's backslidden in his life. You find the very same exact thing in the life of Solomon, the, the way that his life began, his own son, and then the way that it ends is just so very different. And the Bible's filled with this this uh, type and this picture and this portrait that it's painting of, of life. Let me just speak to you young people here for a minute and say to you that life, your entire life is an array of choices that you make. And Samson's life was led up of many choices. And ultimately, where we find Samson's life at the very end of it, and it ends, uh, you know, at the, the, some of the latter part of his life goes into disgrace. We know that at the very end, he destroys more Philistines in his death than in his life. And God was able to get victory out of it. His brother Adam preaches once more, just once more, Lord. And, and he preaches that as a type of the church to say, just once more, Lord, uh, let your spirit come and fill my life. And, but Samson's life ultimately when we find him and he's blind and he's bound and he's shaved, his head is, is shaven, Samson's life was made up of choices. It was an array of decisions and choices that he makes. And, you know, choice is such a very important part or aspect of your life. The decisions that you make, whether they're big and sometimes you're facing things that are large and some major choices of life. And, but, you know, then other times you're making decisions and choices just maybe that would seem insignificant or maybe something that was so small, uh, something just like waking up and going out for the day and what you're going to do for the day and where you're going to go and the, what things you're going to look at and what things you're going to read him. But let me just say this to you, uh, young people. Ultimately, every choice, both great and small, has some measure of impact or consequence for your life. 
And so choices, large and small, little things, maybe things that we listen to, or oh, and God has given us the ability to make a choice, and you choose things in life. And you, you, you may be still living at home under the guidance of your mother and your father, and, and maybe some of the larger decisions they're making for you right now. But even in that stage, in that season of life, you're making choices, even if it's just something as simple as what you believe when you hear the word of God and the choice you make of how you view that or how you're going to apply that to your life. I don't care what stage you're at and what age you're at in life, you're making decisions in your life that will ultimately impact you where you're going to be in the next five years down the road will be determined by the choices that you make very naturally in your life. And, you know, sometimes serving the Lord is, is we can make it as some great big ethereal thing that, you know, and maybe even some great grandiose thing like to really serve the Lord is to go overseas somewhere. And that's wonderful. And that's serving the kingdom of God. And, you know, but we sometimes make it so out of touch that it's some great, it's got to be some great grandiose thing or uh, that serving the Lord has always got to be in this supernatural place and always living and dwelling in the ethereal. But let me just tell you, sometimes serving Serving the Lord and being pleasing to the Lord is a very simple, natural thing that you do every day of your life. And sometimes what, what it means to us is choices that we make and decisions that we make that can have a profound impact. Let me just stop for a minute and say you choose the things that you listen to. You choose the things that you watch and the things that entertain you and the things you allow into the gates of your soul. And, and let me just say this. You choose the friends that you have. You choose those who you choose to associate with and who you choose to allow yourself to come under the influence of. Now, you, you have a choice of where you're going to be employed. Some of you are cho have a choice whether you're going to have continuing education or what school you're going to go to or what job you're going to take or what vocation in life that you'll choose. Those are ultimately choices. And so you pray about those things and you seek the will of God as sons and daughters of God should do. And you say, Lord, I want to be led of your spirit. I want the choice that you want for my life because ultimately you know what's best, Lord, and, and I don't. And so you make choices. And, and you know, God has given you the, the power of choice. And every single one of you have a choice today. And you're living a life of choices. And ultimately, where you end up down the road 20 years or 10 years from now, maybe you're not there yet and you can't see the vision of that. But you can look at your life now and understand where I'm at today is simply a result of choices that I made yesterday. And you've been given the ability of choice. As even Brother Branham says that, you know, that God gives you free moral agency and he gives you the, the ability to make a choice. Uh, Brother Branham talks about in the marriage of the lamb and he says, now God couldn't just push you through some kind of a pipe. He said, if God was to do that, there'd be no victory in that. There'd be no faith in that. But he says, ultimately to overcome, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a choice. God isn't going to force you. He's not going to press you. You're not just going to magically be an unbeliever one day and then a believer by osmosis the other day. No, it's got to be a choice that you make that transcends your dad and your mom and the church you're in or the family you've been raised in, but it comes down to you as an individual to make a choice to say, I'm going to choose to live my life for the Lord Jesus. And so in the large grand picture, what you see is, is that choices, both great and small, uh, you, what you notice after a while of choices is you can notice what maybe we would call a pattern. And you can look at the pattern of someone's life and you notice sort of a certain pattern of choices and they're sort of go, you start to notice that through those little small choices, you see a pattern. And then after you sort of zoom out of the pattern, you sort of see a trajectory of a life right. and you can see which way it's going. Right. You can see, is it going towards the word of the Lord? Is it, is it, is my life a reflection of, of the word of God or is it a reflection of the world? Ultimately, really, right. the mirror of God's word is the only thing that can tell you that. Yes, right, 
And so you notice choices then lead to decisions. Decisions then lead to habits. Habits then build character. And as Brother Brandon preaches in leadership, and ultimately that character determines your destiny. And where you end up in life. You notice a certain ebb and flow, a certain trajectory that a life sort of takes. And you watch it sort of go a certain way. Like Brother Bannon said, that bullet with those sights, if it's just a little bit on the uh, off right here at the, at the muzzle, he said it may just be a hair off. He said, but way down range, it's going to be feet, two or three feet off the target. But it started with just your life just becoming unaligned with God's channel and God's purpose for your life. Right. You hear young people, you're hearing, hearing me today. It's what the Lord just laid upon my heart, and I believe it's for you. You've got to believe that, though, too. And so you ultimately arrive. What you notice here is that you can look at your life now, and you can understand that you have, you have arrived where you're at, 18, 19, 17, 16, 13, no matter where you're at in life, 30, You've ultimately arrived where you're at because of small choices that you made. And so even Samson's life is a life that's made up of choices and decisions. And this is why we, we preach so much on this about your, 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 the decision and the choice that you make. We, we, we speak a lot about the things that you ought to, to do, things you shouldn't watch, places you shouldn't go, things you shouldn't listen to. Because ultimately those are influences and those things are made to influence your choices. And so you look at this and even Samson's life starts out this way. As the Bible said, God anoints his life. His life begins here uh, in Judges chapter 13 as we read it when his mother is visited by this angel. And so Samson learns this as the Bible said. If you could put that first slide up on the, on the screen on the overhead that I sent the PowerPoint. Did you get that? Brother, you can display that. Not sure. Um, how they're doing that, but that's all right. If we didn't uh, didn't get it, it's just fine. Did we give me a thumbs up? Did we get that PowerPoint uh, or not? Where we can display it? No, we didn't. So you didn't get it through email. That's all right. Um, so notice here. I, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna try. Yeah, it looks like I got it. Uh, maybe you can bring a note, brother, with uh, with the right email or where to send that to. Because it's all right. I want to get it up on the screen. Just felt the Lord gave me that, so that's okay. We'll. We'll get it. <clears throat> Sometimes technology uh, fights, but uh, we'll get the victory. You believe Amen. that? Amen. Amen. You can just enter it right there, Brother Luis. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't even know if I've, I think I might, may have. Maybe I can just email it, Brother Luis, so we can have it. Yeah, what's the, you want to type the email? Send it, send it away. I'll attach it once you type it. You know, the Bible says there will be no liars in heaven. Well, there will also be no wires in heaven. <laughs> Good. So I'm just going to put PowerPoint here. I'll attach this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, if you guys just display it there in the back. I just sent it to the email. So if you don't get it, blame Brother Luis. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Nope, that's USB-C. That's all right. I want you to notice this here because it's in it's this photo that I had, the Lord just gave me. Um, okay, we're still going to try. That's all right. I think that's lightning, brother. Nope, nope. That's mini display. That's all right. <laughs> that's okay. I want you to notice this here because I, I, I displayed this and I just emailed it there. If they get it, if we get it up, good. Don't worry. Um, we, we don't have to have. We don't absolutely have to have it, so it's fine. Don't don't struggle. But you notice God anoints Samson's life even from birth, as we read. This angel visits Manoah. And the Bible says that God begins to speak of the purpose of this life. And he says he's going to be a Nazarite unto God. And he's going to begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of their oppressors. And so Samson's life uh, is anointed. We can say that and we hear this term a lot, to be anointed uh, with the Spirit of God. 
And so we know that Samson wasn't filled with the Holy Ghost as you and I are filled uh, by, by the baptism of the Holy Ghost in a new birth. It wasn't, couldn't be a new creature uh, because the Spirit of God hadn't been sent yet. But I just want you to focus here for a moment. He wasn't filled in the, in the sense that we are. But what's amazing is that Samson's life is anointed from the day he breathes his first breath. There's already an anointing, which means a purpose or a plan that God has for his life. Uh, you notice here this, this, uh, this, this word, and it's even the word that we use for, you read this in the Bible and you read, that, uh, you read this about Samson. You also read this about John, uh, the, 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 uh, John the Baptist, that he was filled with the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. It's very much the same exact way that Samson was filled with the Holy Ghost. You read in Psalms 55, 51, where, where David begins to pray and he says, uh, Lord, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Uh, don't do He says, cast me not away and take not your Holy Spirit. Though we know David didn't have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, but what this was, I'm preaching on the value of the Spirit. This was the Spirit of God that was anointing David as a man. Now, this word here for Spirit, and stay with me, young people. I told you I wasn't going to teach, but I just want to bring you, bring you something so that you have it. Uh, Samson's life is anointed and, and, and this word uh, for spirit is actually the, the Hebrew word ruach. Thank you, brother. Jcanada at gmail.com. All right. Let me get this to you, brother. Amen. So we have this. I want you all to see this. So let me just send it again. Here it goes. Amen. Three strikes were out. So we're going to stop after this. Okay, good. Praise the Lord. So we notice this here that this, this, this Samson's life is enabled. It's anointed from birth. God has a purpose. He has a plan for his life. And so God is going to fill Samson with the Spirit of God. Or he's going to fill Samson with the breath of God. He's going to fill Samson with the purpose of God. And the Bible says he shall deliver, begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of of the Philistines. So we know that they were under the oppression of the Philistines because of their backsliding. God actually raised up the Philistines to afflict Israel. And so God would use enemy nations and he would raise up in enemy nations. He takes Pharaoh and he actually calls him my servant. And it wasn't that Pharaoh was a servant of the Lord, but Pharaoh was going to be used for the purposes of God. Uh, we can even see Brother Branham saying Putin. Uh, he speaks of Russia and he says, God will raise up a, a wicked nation and he'll use that as his servant one day to judge this nation. And so, 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 so the Philistines are used as a tool of judgment upon Israel. But now Israel, God is going to raise up a savior because that's what the word judge means. Now, not in the sense of savior like Jesus is savior, but the word, why do we say Jesus is my savior? Because the word savior means deliverer. When we say Jesus saves, what are we saying? When someone says in the Baptist church, they've almost made this a cliche. I'm saved. Are you saved? What does it mean to be saved? Well, saved means to be delivered. It means I've been delivered from something. So Samson would deliver them. Deborah would deliver them. Barak would deliver them. They would begin to save or deliver the people from their oppressor. When we say Jesus saved me, what are we saying? He delivered me from sin. And one day I'll really be saved. One day I'll be delivered out of this body and this flesh and this world. And then I can truly say I'm saved. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so notice this here. If you can just advance to the next slide and go through this. Just an image the Lord gave me. And I wanted you just to fix your mind uh, on that just for a minute, young people. If you could look at that. As you see this picture of this young man, and he's, he's making a choice in his life. He's got a direction that he's going to go. And he can either go left or he can go right. We can see just by the image, if you can see that, that one way is a bright way. One way there's light. One way there's there's, 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 a, there's a life. One way, in one way, there's the right choice. And in the other way, there's the wrong choice. Right. And there's darkness and there's no brightness there. And so he's standing there at the valley of decision trying to make a choice. 
And Samson's life was made up this way. We know that his life was one. If you can just advance to the next slide, that'd be great. Uh, listen to what listen to what D.L. Moody says here. This is powerful. He says, "You might as well try to hear without ears, or breathe without lungs, as try to live a Christian life without the Spirit of God in your heart." Powerful. You might as well try to breathe without lungs or try to hear without ears as to try and attempt to live a Christian life without the Spirit of God. So notice what Samson is filled with as we just go through this. And even in Genesis 1, 2, and it says, Then the earth was without form and void, and, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God, can you say that with me, young people? Can you say the Spirit? The Spirit. So this is the, the word ruach. I'm going to go to the next slide here. And if you can see this, it says it's the, it's the word that he's using for the spirit of God, which if you see the definition is the breath or the wind, the spirit of God. This is what it would mean in Genesis when he said, and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It was the breath of God. It was the wind of God. This is what it means in Genesis 6 when he says, and behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. It's the spirit of life. It's the Ruach of God. It was the Spirit of God. It was the enabling force. It's what made Samson different. Are you here? It's what separated him. This is all that made Samson different. He wasn't special in and of himself outside of of the anointing or the purpose that God placed upon his life. That was the only thing that made Samson different from anybody else. That's the only thing that made Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego come out of the fiery furnace alive and not burn like the rest of the soldiers. It's the only thing that visited that allowed Daniel to come out of the lion's den alive. It's what anointed Samson to be able to lift a gate that weighed 2,000 pounds and carry it 30 miles through the city. It wasn't that Samson was some atlas world man and muscle-bound and bodybuilder and he just had all kinds of muscles popping out of his chest. No, Brother Branham said he was actually a little scrawny shrimp. That's what we used to call people in school. We'd want to really be condescending. You little shrimp, what are you going to do? You little scrawny shrimp. You ain't nothing. You know, Brother Branham says, that's what Samson was. You see, you mean Samson wasn't this big old muscle bound, just strong? No. If he was, then why would Delilah look at him and say, please tell me where in the world do you get your strength from? He was a paradox. It was a miracle. It wasn't laying in his body. It wasn't in his natural figure. It wasn't in his own human ability. What made Samson different was the breath of God and the spirit of God that anointed his life. Notice here, just go through this. In Genesis chapter 8, God remembered Noah and every living thing, and all the cattle is with him in the ark. God made a wind. This was the Ruach. This was the breath of God. He made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuage. Numbers 27, let the Lord, the God of the spirits, the Ruach, the breath, set a man over the congregation. Uh, Job says, as long as I have life within me, the breath, the Ruach of God in my nostrils, the Spirit of God has made me. The breath of the Almighty gives me life. And Isaiah, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom. This is a prophecy of Messiah. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Jesus in Matthew 3, when he was baptized, went straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God, the Ruach, the breath. The enabler. He's seen the spirit of God dwelling, descending like a dove and lighting upon him. 
And so we know this. The Bible speaks of these throughout the entire Old Testament. You find people, regular human people that were not any different than any other people in the earth except that God breathed upon them. So his power, this was the enabling force. This is what David was so fearful to lose. To say, don't let your spirit depart from me. Don't take that anointing that David valued. I'm preaching on valuing the spirit. David had a value for the spirit of God in his life. In so much that he would pray that prayer, don't take it from me, Lord. So what, what was the spirit of God to do? It was to make them what they could not otherwise be. I want to take that image of Samson out of your mind as some muscle man. Brother Samson is just a curly-headed shrimp. He had no ability in his own self. But when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, Samson was able to slay thousands of Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. How, Brother Matt? How did Samson overcome? How could? How did he have this ability? Was he some kind of special Superman or some superhero? No, he was just a normal. David was just so normal and so ordinary that his own father see no value in his life. He was so ordinary and so plain, maybe so weak, and just looked like so simple that his own father couldn't see the value. But God looked beyond the simplicity of his flesh and his humanity, and God seen a heart that he could anoint with his life. And when man seen nothing but a shrimp and man seen nothing but a simple man, God seen a conqueror. Why? Was David any different? No, it was that the Spirit of God could come upon the flesh of David. And David could have faith to say, this Philistine, I'll cut his head off today. It was the enabling power to be what they couldn't otherwise have been and to say what they couldn't have said. God gave Samson the power to kill a lion, uh, to carry a city gate 20 miles, to weigh thousands of pounds. You say, Brother Matt, when could Samson do that? Only when the Spirit of God dwelled upon him. Even the spirit of prophecy in the man a man like Ezekiel, son of man, prophesy, speak into these bones. He would say, he would, he, God, what would God do when he took Jeremiah, a man, a normal man, when he would take men like Amos, normal men. But God would literally take his spirit or his anointing and he would baptize that human vessel with his life. What was the purpose? For fireworks, for show, so that everyone could applaud? No, it was so that that man could be used as a tool or an instrument for the purpose of God. So why would God anoint Samson's life? To deliver his people. The Old Testament's filled with this, with men that could speak through their mouth words that they otherwise couldn't speak because it wasn't their words. When you rejected God with Jeremiah, you weren't rejecting Jeremiah because it wasn't his words. You were rejecting Jehovah. Amen. When you hear the words of a prophet that God would anoint, it wasn't the words of a Kentucky hillbilly. It was the mind of Christ. So when you reject the prophet, you're not rejecting a man from Kentucky. You're rejecting Almighty God. And so the Old Testament, the Bible ends with these powerful characters, but it ends with a promise. It's left with two simple promises, two, about this spirit and this power that enabled this ruach, this breath, and he would breathe upon Samson. He'd breathe his life. As the Bible says, Adam, uh, even, even the first man, as the Bible says, but yet he had no life, so God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then Adam became a living soul. Job says this, the breath of God, the very wind of God, the spirit of God enables me to live. 
Outside of that, he's no different than any other man. Outside of that, he's just like any other person. You say, Brother Matt, why is that even important? Why are you parping and preaching on that? Because I'm trying to get you to understand, young people, the miracle of Samson was not Samson. The miracle of Samson's strength was never about Samson. And let me just tell you today, you'll never overcome because you are like any other person. You can look in the mirror and say, I'm just like any other person. It's never about you. It was never about you. It never will be about about you. It's about the spirit of God that can come into a vessel of your life and you'll conquer the devil when you otherwise couldn't. You'll get victory over the enemy in your body. When you failed many times and you've tried many times and say, I just can't overcome it. But when the spirit of God enters your life. Remember, Brother Branham speaks about his own nephew, and he's talking about the boy that he's got a temper, and he talks about the mother and the father, and, and he's this boy is going to marry this girl, and he's just so rude, and he can't say, I'm sorry. And Brother Branham begins to talk to the man, and he says, look at you. Or he talks to the woman and says, you're German, and your people, they just stare at you. They don't say anything. They don't speak to you. And he looks at the woman and he says, but you're not that way. Your entire family's that way. Meaning a morning, I'd come to his, this woman's sister, and the prophet says, I'd look at her and say, sure a fine morning, ma'am, isn't it? He said, she'd just stare at me. Brother Branham said, I'd say to her, you ought to come see us. Ought to come see us someday. Brother Branham said, she'd just look right at me and stare at me, just German, real stoic, independent. And he says, all of them's that way, except that one sister, except that one woman in the entire family. And Brother Branham says, look at you. And, and here the, the family is trying to diagnose what's wrong with my son. And, and, and Brother Branham says, look at your life. He says, he says but you're not that way. And he, then he points to the father of the boy. And he says, look at your family. They're all fighters and drunks. Now, it's Brother Branham's own family. He doesn't tell they don't date, but it's his own nephew he's speaking to. And he says, look at all of them. He said, they're fighters. They're drunks. They're alcoholics. And he says, they, 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 he says that's, that's, they, they, that's what they are. They're brawlers. And he looks into the man and he says, but you, out of your entire family, he says, but yet you're not that way. And Brother Man says, now what did that to you? And he points to the mom and he says, what made you different from the rest of your sisters? He points to the dad. What made you different? He said, that's the spirit of Christ down inside of you. And he says, see, when you get the indwelling of the Spirit of God, I love how the prophet says this. He says, when you get the Holy Ghost, it's no longer your people anymore. It's your Christ living down inside of you. You're not subject to your family anymore. You're subject to a new name and a new family. So the Bible would, would come and Samson was no different than anybody else. Except the Spirit of God. He was no different than anybody else. And you find that out when the Spirit of God leaves him. And then he's bound. And then they poke out his eyes. What happens? The Spirit of the Lord departs from Samson's life and he's no different than anybody. So you tell me, Brother Matt, what happens when you take the Spirit of God out of our churches? When you remove the spirit of the Lord and you turn the message and you turn preaching and you just turn it into a dress code and you turn it into a book of rules and all you do is what you don't do and I don't do this and I don't do that and I don't do this and I don't go here and we don't do this and we don't cut our hair and we don't. When you make it just about mechanics and what you're doing and you remove the spirit of God, you're no different than any other church. You're no different than anybody else. But when you value the Spirit of God, which is the enabler of the Word of God. And Jesus, the Bible tells us there would be a promise left. That there would come a man, not like Samson who came upon the Spirit of God, would come upon him that can leave. But there would come a man that was so full of the breath of God. Uh, he was so anointed with the Spirit of God. That same wind that breathed upon David. And he would say, don't let your spirit depart from me. The same wind that breathed upon Samson, there would come a man. And the Old Testament prophesied in Isaiah that the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of knowledge and the spirit of understanding would rest upon him. 
What was Jesus? He was fully anointed. He was all that Samson was. He was all that David was. He was all that Abraham was. He was all that Moses was in one single human vessel. He had all of the gifts of the Spirit. He would have all of the fruits of the Spirit. He would have all of the abilities. He would have the power of creation in his, in his mouth. The Bible says it this way. He would have the breath of God without measure. Without limit. Say, oh, that's so wonderful, Brother Matt. Look at Jesus and look at this limitless, powerful. But you know what? There was a second promise that after that, the Spirit of the Lord would be poured out upon all flesh so that one man from one man upon whom all the Spirit of God dwelled, there would come many men and many women who all had different abilities and gifts, but the same, not the same breath The Bible says that the the same power that raised Jesus from the dead dwells inside of you. What is it, Brother Matt? It's the enabling force. It's the enabling power that was upon Samson's life to make him what God intended for him to be. Now, what God intended and what the devil intended was two very different things. God had a course. He had a path. He had a direction that he could go. If you could just display that PowerPoint, that image again. He had a direction he could go. Samson's life was presented with this choice. An anointing. You know, it's a powerful thing when God anoints a life. It's a powerful thing when the Spirit of God takes control of a son of God or a daughter of God. As Brother Branham says, oh... The greatest problem down throughout history for God is to find somebody who he could get under his complete control. The great problem all down through the history of the church, prophet of God repeats it six or seven times, is to find one vessel, someone who will totally sell out, someone who will totally give of themselves, someone who will completely surrender mind, body, spirit, and soul. And when God can find a vessel, a true son or daughter of God, who he could pour out his life, he could pour out his anointing, they could be so emptied out and freed out and emptied and cleaned out every channel in their spirit. That's when God can use your life. When you've poured out and you've emptied out all of yourself, how many could say, Lord, let me empty out myself? Let me empty out, clean out the channels of my mind so that your purpose and your spirit and your anointing. Oh, if God could just get one man, Brother Adam says, if he could just get one man under his complete control. That's all he needs, prophet of God says, is one man, one woman. I'm going to speak to the men here just for a moment. It's just what the Lord told me to do. So. So you brothers, just listen real close because this is what the Lord inspired me to say. I'm going to speak to everybody, but just for a moment. If he could get one man with a purpose. You see, man is God's key to his kingdom. Man, men, man. I'm not talking about what the world defines as a man. They've lost the meaning of manhood. Brother Branham even speaks about that in his age. He said, it almost can't tell them apart. He said, there's really no men, that burliness. Men are so soft now. And he says, you almost can't tell a man apart from from anything else. And boy, if it was that way then, my goodness, how is it today? You see, a man was God's purpose. Even in the beginning, I want you young people, keep the screen there. If you have your Bible, even if you have to use your phone, I'm going to give you permission to do that. Look up Genesis chapter 1. I want you to look at this because I want you to read it with me, especially you men. If you don't have a Bible or a phone, with a, you could use a Bible, then, then use your neighbors there. I want you to read this together. I believe this is just directly from the Lord. Notice this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. I'm just hearing the rustling of the leaves, so I'll just give it just a moment for you to find your, your spot. Genesis chapter 1, and I want you to read verse 26 with me. You got it, say amen, young people. Amen. All right, well, wait, they didn't say amen. You got it, say amen, young people. Amen. amen. Verse 26, and God said, notice, let us make man 
in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion. That's an important word. Let us make man in our image, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. And notice this word, and subdue it. Take control of it because what you don't take control of, men in your life will become out of control. But you were created to take dominion. You were created to subdue. He says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, and every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So man is the key. Even God starts the home, the family, the marriage. Everything starts with men finding their proper anointing in their life. Say, Brother Matt, my anointing. Yes, your life as a son of God has to be anointed for a purpose. Say, is it something I'm going to feel? I'm going to shake. No, I'm not talking about that type of anointing here. I'm talking about the design or the blueprint that before you were ever born or came onto this earth, God drew up the plans. Then he had them engineered. Then he stamped them with his own approval and said, I've got a purpose. I've got a plan. I've already got, I've already charted your course long before you were on this earth. God already wrote out your entire story. But it will be up to you to subdue and have dominion and find your place as a son of God. And let me just say, until you do, it will never work. If you're a seed of God and you've got the, and you've got a, you, if God has predestinated you and you've got a seed gene of God down inside your life, you can run and you can run, but it will never work. Because man is the key from the very beginning. A man under the influence, not of drugs, not the influence of worldly things, not the influence of sports or video games. You weren't born to play video games. That's not your purpose. Your purpose isn't, only in, 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 your purpose isn't found in some uh, Twitch uh, uh, career or some streaming career. That's not your purpose. That's a perversion of the devil trying to take God's plan, ball it up and throw it out and give you his. So, but the matter you preaching against video games? No, you can take anything in your life and maybe it's harmless and it's okay for you to do recreation, whether it's sports, whether it's a career, no matter what it is. And if Satan could do anything, he'll take that thing that is harmless and unsinful and he'll so inundate you and wrap you up and bind you with the spirit that's upon it to where something that maybe wasn't sinful now is. A man under the influence of the Holy Ghost. When I say influence, I mean he's under the control of the mind of God. (laughs) A man under the control of the Holy Ghost. He's sold out. He's consecrated like Samson. He's a Nazarite. It sp- speaks of the head of consecration. He's consecrated to the purpose that God has placed in his life. And let me just tell you today, when there's a man who's a seed of God who has sold out his life to the purpose of God, and he's let, not saying he's perfect, I'm not saying he doesn't make mistakes, but he's single-minded to say, though none go with me, still I'll follow. I've got a purpose, I've got a direction, and it's the word of God in my life. When God can get a man like that, he is God's greatest weapon. 
He will tear down the kingdom of devils. He will tear down purposes of Satan and demonic spirits and influences. You say, Brother Matt, why aren't you preaching on the, on the, on the women? Let me tell you what Brother Branham says. You be a son of God and she'll be a daughter of God. She was created to be that if a man will just find his proper place. You want to take a home that's going the wrong way and children are going the wrong way and it looks like the trajectory is going the wrong way? How do you save that home, Brother Matt? Let a son of God repent and get under the control of the Holy Spirit and you'll watch a home that quickly gets in line. But watch a man get out of his place and get distracted and tangled up and entangled in the wrong things and his mind isn't single and he's at church but he's really not and he's there but he's really not and he's got a career and maybe a job and he's so focused on what the on what the devil wants him to focus on and he's missed the anointing God has in his life. You'll watch a family begin to crumble. Because man is not on the top. I'm not talking about a chauvinist. Man is the foundation of the home. Where is the foundation of the home? It's on the bottom. Created this this picture in people's minds that man is the head of the house, and we create the head because the head is up here. And we say, the man lords over. He's over. No, that's a perversion. The first man, the true man, was the foundation the house was built upon. And when a man is in his proper place under his anointing, how God has made him. Young men, when you can find the the, the purpose and consecrate your life to that purpose, God can use you as one of his greatest tools in his toolboxes. He could take one man who's dedicated and sold out to the purpose of God. And he could take an entire, maybe an entire youth group and a dynamic that's existing in that youth group to pull them the wrong way. Let one son of God get the baptism of the Holy Ghost in his heart and come into his proper position. And he'll tear the devil's kingdom down in a church. Oh, I want to say, Lord, use me. Could you say that, young people? I just feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Maybe for one man that could raise a hand and say, Lord, use my life. I want to be consecrated to your purpose, oh, Lord. He's God's greatest weapon. You know, who, you know the problem, though, is that there's another being who knows that a man under the inspiration of the anointing and control of the Holy Ghost is God's greatest weapon. The devil knows that also. Man is God's foundation. So if you break the man, you break the foundation. And what happens when you break the foundation, the rest of the home collapses. He's the foundation that creates and carries the rest of The house, even when God creates man, it's a reflection of himself. When he creates the home, it's a reflection of his own dominion, his own dwelling. Even when he creates his position, his calling, he says, subdue it. Have dominion over it. You're to be an administrator, a steward over the gift that God has placed in your life. Remember, Brother Branham says, I would have served him years ago. Even in my teenage years, he said, I would have came to the Lord sooner, but a spirit hung over me, preventing me from doing that. So let me just say this to you young people. Samson was anointed with a purpose before he was ever born. And though Samson never surrendered fully to that purpose, it was with him the entire time. It never left him. And the purpose of God abides with your life, even if a spirit's hanging over you today to get you to repel the word of God and not fully surrender to the word of God. Make no mistake, God's purpose is still there all the time. This is why Paul said in in Galatians 5, I say then, walk in the spirit. What's he saying? Walk in your anointing. Walk in the spirit of God. And you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary one to the other. So 
What happens? God says, I'm going to create man. Look in Genesis chapter 2. If you have it there, just pull it up. Uh, keep that before, before us. But I want you to use your Bible or your phone there. Uh, Thus saith the heavens and the earth. This is Genesis chapter 2. I'm going to read this. It's going to maybe differ just slightly from the New King James, but let me just read it. You read along with me. Verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God in his work. Verse 4, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day the Lord God made the earth and the heavens before any plan of the field was in the earth. Let me, just, let me move past some of this. In Genesis chapter 2, look at verse 15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him. Then the Lord God took the man who he created, just like he created the fish, just like he created the birds, he creates man in his own image, and God takes the man, and God places the man in the Garden of Eden. When God puts you somewhere, it's where you're supposed to be. And when you come out of and you leave where God placed you, it'll never work. I'm going to keep saying that. You can try and you could push and you could toil and you can sweat, but when you're outside of where God placed you, it won't work. So he puts him in the Garden of Eden to tend and keep it. So what was Eden? You say, Brother Matt, it was this garden. Don't think of a garden. Eden was a condition. Eden was an atmosphere. Eden was an ecosystem. It was a dwelling place. It's where God placed man. It's how God created him. You see, before God ever created the fish, he created the atmosphere or the ecosphere for that fish to live in. And if the fish lives in the place God made him to live, the fish can live. But when you take that fish out of the place God was made for, God made for him to live, what happens to the fish? When you bring him into your environment, he's not created for it. So his gills maybe for a little while can breathe and you can see him breathe after you catch that fish and he's breathing and he's breathing. And you think, oh, he's fine. He's just going to do good. No, he can't because he wasn't made for that atmosphere. He wasn't made for it. Maybe temporarily he can live in it. But after a while, if he's not made for the atmosphere that he's in, he'll die. So Eden... The pro was what? It housed the presence or the spirit of God. It housed the spirit of the Lord. That's where the spirit of God came and the cool of the evening. What was the spirit of God? It was the breath of God. How does man, how is Adam going to live? How is he going to function like God made him to function? As long as Adam lives to the laws that were created for him, Adam can continue to function how God made him. And so what is, the, what is the law that God made? The spirit of the Lord was Adam's lifeline. The spirit of God that would visit Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening. Oh, hallelujah. You see, every time God creates, created something, he first created the atmosphere for that something to live in. Before he made the fish, as we said, he made the water. The water was created for the fish. Hello? Before he made plants, what did he create, young people? Before he ever made the first beautiful flower that you can go and you can smell and you can enjoy. And, oh, it's so, girls love it so much. And you get a girl flowers and, oh, oh, just so beautiful. And they just love them. I've not... I, I just have never, I like think flowers are pretty, but boy, you don't ever get me flowers for my birthday. I, I mean, I'll try to act like I like them, right. try to act like I'm happy, Amen. try to put on a show. But the girl, she doesn't have to. She just, oh, she smells that aroma and it just melts her heart. Before you ever smelled that beautiful flower and you enjoyed its beauty, before God ever created the flower, he created the soil. And without the soil, the flower's not beautiful. Before, what was it? The soil was created for the plant, not vice versa. Oh, before God created the stars, what did he make? The firmament. 
What was the purpose of the firmament? It was so that a star could be a star. As long as the star dwelt in the firmament, it could shine like the stars. As long as the plant, as long as the flower, I hope so bad you're catching me, young people. As long as the flower stayed in the soil, it could be a beautiful purpose. It could fulfill the purpose of God for its life. But what happens when you take that flower and you pull it out of the soil? You might put it in a pretty little clear vase and pour water in there and you put it in front of your window for some sunlight. And you try and you try and you water it and you water it and you give it enough sun. How many sisters can testify? Just after a while, suddenly that flower will start to lower its leaves. Then little petals will fall off. It will eventually die. You know why? Because though you try to make it live in an atmosphere it wasn't created for, it can never live. You might love that you, 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 you might take it and take it out of the ground and oh, I could just admire it. And it is, but God created the soil because he, 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 he creates the atmosphere because in a hope so bad you see this, it's the atmosphere or the condition or the soil that allows it to function how it was created to function. But when you remove the fish from the water, it can no longer function as it was created to function. The fish has to have the water. The plant has to have the soil. What happens to the star when you take it out of the firmament? It becomes a falling star. And something that was meant for you to get, get, get uh, you can sit there and gaze at it and enjoy it, now becomes destructive. And just like the fish needs the water, you need the Spirit of God. Amen. Because man was created for the Spirit of God to dwell inside in the tabernacle. You take a fish out of the water, he dies. You take a flower out of the ground, it dies, it withers. You take a star, it becomes a falling star, a meteor, and it actually destroys itself. It begins to break up. And when you take a man who is created to be subjected to the Holy Spirit and under the control of the anointing of God in his life, and when you remove him out of that purpose and out of that spirit, he destroys himself. And a man who was created to be the greatest weapon becomes the greatest tool for the devil. You watch men and, and who, who lived outside of the condition that God created for them. Take a son of God, remove him from the presence of God. Put, a, put something in his life that bege he begins to lust after and begins to chase after. That man that was created to be a healer will become a destroyer. He'll destroy children. He'll destroy wives. He'll destroy the atmosphere of the home. He'll self-destruct. Why, Brother Matt? Because he wasn't made to live there. And let me just stop here for a moment, young people. There are people in this world, the Bible calls them the children of disobedience, the children of darkness, and another place it calls them. And this is Satan's Eden, and there's certain conditions, there's certain things that water Satan's Eden. There's certain things that give it light and give it life. And there's certain people who can live in Satan's Eden, and they can feed on Satan's Eden, and they can drink from Satan's Eden, and they'll be just fine. But if you're a son of God, you may try to fit in, you may try to force yourself through, but you'll never fit in this Eden because you weren't created for it. You'll always be out of place. You'll always be an oddball. Because you weren't created for Satan's Eden. And it will never work. I'm trying, and that you can try all you want and try to look cool and try to fit in with that crowd at school and try to fit in and do the right things and try to say the right things. But listen, you'll never fit. It'll never work. You say, Brother Matt, what will happen? If you don't yield and surrender to the presence of God, you'll destroy yourself. Just like Samson destroyed himself because he tried to live in an atmosphere he was never created to live in. Are you here? Can we go just a little bit further? 
Samson's anointed from birth. Very special. The Bible says he'll begin to deliver Israel. It was something he was born with. Something that would enable, as we said, his life. But what happens? You say, Brother Matt, it's so beautiful. God uses him. He's born under a Nazarite vow. God uses him uh, to defeat the enemy. You can read the victories of Samson, the thousands of Philistines he, he kills. You can read when the Spirit of God came upon him mightily and powerful things took place in Samson's life. Now God visits Manoah and tells him, you're barren. I'm going to deliver you through your barrenness. You'll conceive and tells her, don't drink anything strong. Don't eat any, uh, any unclean thing because this deliverer is going to be built with a purpose. In other words, in other words, God is telling his mother and his father, I've drawn the blueprints up for Samson. I've already, I've already constructed them and as an architect will go through and he starts, he's not aimlessly. An architect doesn't just start and sort of meander and just, you know, I think maybe I'll put the, this here and I, no, he's already got a vision before he takes his pen and starts drawing. He's already got something in his mind. And then he begins to draw those prints. Then he engineers them to make sure they're going to stand. And make sure they're going to stand up to the tests and the trials and the storms and the difficulties that it'll face. And long before God, long before the builder ever takes the first piece of wood and the first nail and hammers it, there's already been an architect who's already designed it. There's already been an engineer that says if you build it according to the prince, if you build it according to how I've engineered it, it will withstand every storm. It will withstand every wind. It will withstand everything that the devil wants to throw its way because I've already engineered its life. And listen to me, family of God. Are you there in this church here tonight? Long before your trial or your test or your wind or your storm ever came, God already engineered you to be able to stand in the day of evil, in the evil day. He already anointed your life. That means there's nothing the devil can throw at you to knock you out. But God's already anointed Samson's life. I've already drawn it. In fact, I've already charted his course. Samson's life is already charted. I've already written the story. I've got a plan, a calling, an anointing. I've seen it from the beginning. You say, Brother Matt, does God really call my life that way? Jeremiah, some of your favorite scriptures in chapter 29, verse 11. I know the plans thou hast for me. Jeremiah begins to say, the Lord speaking and says, I know the plans. I know the thoughts. I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace not of evil, to give you an expected end. What is God saying in this verse of Jeremiah? Your end is already determined. God's already thought. David says, you've numbered my days. You know the beginning, you know the middle, you know the end, you know the teenage years, you know the adolescent years, you know my first, whatever I'm going to face, Lord, you've already drawn them out, you've already charted them, you've already given it away, you've already engineered them, you've already planned them. The Bible said he's planned the life of every individual. He's given the life. Your life has specific instructions. And if you don't obey the instructions, it'll never work. So what we find is here that every life has a purpose. Even Pharaoh, the Bible says, was raised up and born into the world for a purpose. Can you say amen tonight? Even Judas was born in the earth with a certain specific calling and anointing and plan and instructions in his life. Even Pharaoh was given. Judas was given. Oh, but let me remind the devil, God also specifically designed my life. God also raised me up for a purpose. And it's not to be a Pharaoh and it's not to be a Judas. You've got to believe that young person. I was not made and born into this world to be a Judas, but I was born to 
to cut the devil's head off. I was raised up in this latency in church age to destroy the kingdom of Satan. We've got a purpose in this age. You say, oh, that's so wonderful, Brother Matt, such good preaching. Oh, my, God's already planned it. He's already instructed it. He's already blueprints. He's already an architect, an engineer. He's already charted my course. Oh, how wonderful. Now let me just put my life on cruise control. Uh Uh-uh. It don't work that way. You see, because in the middle of all of God's planning for Samson's life, there was one thing called free moral agency. And Samson was a man who was also made up of memory, conscience, reasoning, imagination, affection. All the gates of his spirit and the gates of his eyes and the gates of his mouth. God had all this purpose and all this plan and all of this planning and all this forethought. But you see, the cost of the choice, something maybe so small that has big consequences. Samson saw a woman of Timnath of the daughter of the Philistines. Why? Why, Samson? God didn't choose your wife to be a Philistine. Let me just say this, young people. Your soulmate does not wait in some church down the road that doesn't believe what you believe. Your soulmate does not wait as some unconverted person that you're going to lead to the message and lead to the truth. Your, 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 your soulmate who God has for you does not live outside of this message. But God has ordained you. Let let me just stop here for a minute because I believe the Holy Spirit's telling me to say this, so I'm just going to say it. God has ordained a specific path and a plan, but you have a choice to either take that way or take another one and destroy your life. And she doesn't live. He doesn't live. Oh, I'm just going to, I'll just lead them to the Lord. I I love how Brother Burley Williams, I think it was Brother Burley who said it. If you can get them in with a hot dog, someone will get them out with a hamburger. You might be able to persuade them in, but if they're not, if it's not revealed to them and they're not born into it, it might go 10 years, might go 20, might go 30, but eventually that kingdom will come down. It's the cost of a choice. He's taking a Nazarite vow. Stay away from dead things. Samson was a Nazarite. John the Baptist was a Nazarite. Jesus was a Nazarite. But even with that Nazarite vow that Samson takes, he makes the wrong choice. The wrong choice. His mother and his father say, Samson, is there not a daughter of her own people that you've got to go into the Philistines? You know, what was the mom? What was the dad? You know, the problem with Samson, he looks at it and says, you know what? That's just mom. What Samson failed to see is that it wasn't just mom. It wasn't just dad. But actually, Manoah was a vessel of mercy that God had in Samson's life. And that vessel of mercy was there to stop Samson. And God has placed vessels of mercy in your life, young people. Listen to me, sisters, brothers. God has placed vessels of mercy. And if you're not careful, you'll do like Samson and you'll say, oh, that's just mom. Oh, that's just dad. Of course, of course, dad's going to say that. Of course. What did I expect? Mom, of course. Samson didn't realize it wasn't just mom. It wasn't just dad. It was a vessel of mercy that God anointed in his life to get him to turn around and go the other way. It was a warning sign. You know warning signs? When you drive and you see a flashing yellow light and you got a bear a barricade and it says road closed. Road closed, flashing. Do not enter. How many people would get in their car? And then the road to the left is open, but the road to the right says, road closed, do not enter. And you just go right through the barricade and just bust over sandbags, and there goes barrels flying. You go through that barricade, and it's flashing, turn around, do not enter, wrong way. How many people would get in their car and just bust over barricade, and bust over barricade, and bust over barricade? You say, Brother Matt, I would never do that. But how many times in your life does God put mothers and fathers and pastors and people and friends who try to tell you and encourage you? 
and you break right over the prayers of a mother and right over the encouragement of a pastor, even of a sermon, and God puts, what are those? Those are warning signs. Those are flashing lights to say, turn around. Go the other way. That thing that you have in your life is destroying you. It's eating away your mind. It's taking, turn around, do not enter, go the other way. Samson just keeps going. Right to the next one. Right to the next one. Just going to keep going. Don't matter. That's just mom. That's just dad. That's how I was raised. And, and you know, eventually it, it ends. Eventually Amen. it ends. Yep. Judges chapter 16, turn there as we close. I know I've been a little lengthy, but just give me just a minute and we'll, we'll close. Notice what it says here in verse 4 and came to pass afterward, verse six, chapter 16, that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. And the Lord of Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, He enticed him, see where in his great strength lieth, by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him. This is the devil's purpose. No matter what he brings into your life, he has one single purpose. To wrap you up and bind you. Wrap you and wrap you and wrap you and get you deeper and deeper, deeper. To where you're, you're in his web to bind you, to afflict him. Delilah said in verse 6, Tell me, I pray, where does your great strength lie? Where is, wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee? Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green widths that were never dried, and then shall be weak and be as another man. The Lord of Philistines brought him up seven green widths which had not been dried. She bound him with them. Now, and were men lying in wait, <laughs> abiding in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. You notice that in verse 9, there were men lying in wait. There were men lying in wait. And then Samson is laying asleep, and there's men waiting to pounce. He doesn't know. He has no idea. There's their demon spirits waiting just for him, just for the right moment to give entrance. Give me a spot where I can come in. And then... The Philistines be upon you, Samson. <laughs> Notice what it says in verse, 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 uh, verse 9. There were men lying in wait, biting in the chamber. She said, the Philistines be upon them. And he broke the widths as a thread of a toe is broken when it touches the fire, so his strength was not known. You know, it never says that those men who were lying in wait ever busted through the doors when she said that. Right. The Philistines be upon them. They never came out. You know what they were doing? They were waiting to see. But they were still there, lingering, right, right, right. just for the right moment and the right time. And then Delilah says, you've lied to me. You've mocked me. You've told me lies. Verse 11, he said unto her, if thou bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall be weak and be as another man. Delilah took ropes, bound him therewith, said unto him, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars. There it is again. There were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber, and he broke them from off his arms like a thread. They never came out. They never attacked. You know, that's the deceitfulness of sin. That just because your life seems to be going good and everything's fine and you're doing the wrong thing, making the wrong chase, choices, sneaking behind mom, sneaking behind dad, you got a separate life that you live. Oh, it's just fine. There's liars in wait waiting. You may not see them. And he broke them from his arms. She says in 13, you've told me lies. Tell me where thou mightest be bound. He said unto her, if they, weave, if they weave us the seven locks. You notice? Notice what's happening? It's getting closer. Started here in his hands. Then it goes to his arms. Then now it's moving up closer, closer. Now it's in his hair. It's getting closer. And she said, he said, uh, verse 12, and there were liars in wait. Verse 13, Delilah said to the Samson, hey, you've mocked me. And he says, he said in there, if thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web, and she fastened with the pen, and said to them, the Philistines be upon the Samson. They woke out of sleep, went away with the pen and the beam and with the web. And she said, how can thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and has not told me where in thy great strength lieth. Came to pass when she pressed him daily. When she pressed him daily. When the devil's after you, he presses you daily. And in our generation, it's hourly. 
It's every minute. In fact, while you've been sitting here in church, there's been notifications popping up on your phone. Incessant, notify, 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 notify. Look, look, look. You're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. If there was ever an age that tries to suppress the voice of God in your life, it's now. And Satan will press you and press you and press you and get you no time if he can do anything. He'll give you no time to contemplate and to think and to disconnect. Get you to go, 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 go. Next day, you got to push on. You got to move through. What's happening tomorrow? What's going to, what's my life going to look like? What's planning? And if Satan can do anything, he'll get you just to shh, tell that voice of God, shh, quiet. Trying to live my life here. Samson. She pressed him daily with her words. Notice this here in verse 16 and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death that he told her all his heart. Said, there has not come a razor upon mine head for I've been a Nazareth unto God. From my mother's womb, even if I, be, if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and I and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called, now the liars in wait, now. Now they bust through the doors. Come up this once for he has showed me all his heart. And the Lord of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hands. She made him sleep upon her knees. She called for a man. She caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him that his strength went from him. She said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke. Notice, young people. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I'll go out as other times before, as last year at camp. And the year before that, I'll just go and I'll come to the altar and once again I'll repent and I'll get clean about it. I'll just wait till youth camp and, and surely I can just keep doing these things because I'll just go out as other times before we'll have another youth meeting. And then I'll get free of it then. Don't talk to me about it now. There will come a day in my life when don't worry, I'll, I'll eventually surrender. I'll go out as other times and shake myself. And he wist not, that means knew, and he knew not that the Lord was departed. Had no idea. That's why I said the saddest part of the story is not a man. A man. Samson's story is not about a strong man. It's about a very weak man. It's not about the strength of man. It's about the weakness of man. Samson, your purpose you had a plan. You had a blueprint. God ordained it. God anointed it. He wrote it. He drew it. Yet you at every point in your life and every time you had to make a choice, you made the wrong one, the wrong one, the wrong one, the wrong one, the wrong one. And those choices were leading, leading, leading Leading. You may have not noticed you were moving at all. You may not have realized that you were going a certain direction because I was still coming to church. I was still there. I was still in the same home. But all the while, their hearts slowly turning, turning, hardening. You have no idea what's taking place in your heart. You have no idea. He knew not the Lord was departed. Verse 21, but the Philistines took him, put out his eyes, brought him down to Gaza, bound him with fetters of brass. Brother Branham said, brass represents judgment. Fetters of brass, and now Samson's bound, his eyes are out. You know, let me just say something to you here tonight. Samson was blind long before they put his eyes out. Samson was bound long before they put physical chains on him. You see, bondage comes in all kinds of forms. Bondage comes in not just physical outward manifestations, sicknesses other than cancer in the flesh. There's also cancer of the spirit and of the soul. There's also spiritual blindness and spiritual deafness. And in fact, deafness and blindness is just a spirit. That's all it is. 
doctors treat the physical, but Brother Branham said it's, it's, a, it's a spirit. Deafness is a spirit. Blindness is. That's why Jesus in Mark 9 tells the man who couldn't, the, the, the dumb and deaf man, he says, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, come out of the man, and I command you not to enter him again. It wasn't the disease, it was a spirit that was on him. And Samson's life has allowed an entrance to spirits in his life. And now he's blind, just an outward representation of what took place in his heart. He's bound, just an outward representation of what happened what was slowly wrapping him and binding him. And eventually Samson's life, a life that was called for a purpose, a life that was charted, a life that had a specific course, a life that had a moment, a moment of decision, a moment of decision where you could go left or you could go right. And you know what, young people? No mom's going to make that choice for you. No dad can make that choice for you. That's something that happens right here. And no, 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 nobody, as much as we wish, as much as a parent would wish, oh, I wish so bad I could, I could fill them with the Holy Spirit. I wish so bad I could surrender for them. I wish so bad, Lord, but you can't. You've got to make that choice and that decision for yourself. The sadness of this was that Delilah's name, even her name, means to slack off. Did you know that? That's what Delilah's name meant, to ease up. Her name means ease up, slack off. Lose, this is what it means. Because this is what the devil's plan was. His plan was to rob him and to strip him of power and strength. And so her name means to slack up, to slack off, to ease up. And I love this one, to lose intensity. Samson starts off strong with life and he separated unto God a Nazarite. And then 20 years go by and nothing's talked about about Samson doing anything for the Lord. Doesn't talk about the Spirit of God moving upon Samson's life. No more mighty victories for Israel. But he grows weary. He grows cold. He grows carnal. And he's laying in the lap of Delilah, a very manifestation of what had happened in his life. Or even her name means to lose intensity, to relax, just to let off let up. If there was ever a time I could come from South Carolina and I could tell you young people here in Georgia, if there was ever a time to not lose your intensity, it's right now. If there was ever a time to wake up and shake yourself, if there was ever a time to surrender and say, Lord, Let me value the Spirit of God. Could you bow your heads with me, young people? Could you every head bowed? Maybe you with no one looking around, you could raise a hand. I'm not even going to look. I'm going to keep my head bowed. Maybe you could raise a hand and say, Lord, don't let me lose my intensity right now. Let me value the presence of God and the Spirit. Raise your hand and say, Lord, I want your Spirit of God. Maybe I don't have it. I want want that enabling power and that enabling force to dwell in my life to consecrate my vessel, to fill me, to cleanse me of every impure thing. Maybe you can do that, young person, with a hand raised and say, Lord, I want to surrender to that blueprint that you've drawn. I want to surrender to that charted course that you've planned. It'll never work. It's not worked. Lord, I want to, I want to live in the atmosphere you, were, you created me to live in. I want to stop fighting. How many could say, I surrender by an uplifted hand? It's a sign of surrender to say, Lord, I'm going to surrender right now. God sees those hands up. Both of my hands are up right now. Say, Lord, let me fully surrender to the purpose of, of God in my life. How many can raise a hand? I'm going to raise mine up and say, Lord, let me be that one vessel that you can get under your complete control. Where you fully get under your complete control, let me be sold out. Let me be sold out and dedicated. Oh, if there was ever an age where we need people that are sold out to the purpose and the plan of God up there in his life, it's right now. So, Lord, I just surrender right now. Asking you, Father, to come and cleanse me of every unpure thing. 
Cleanse me, Jesus. These young people that are here tonight, musicians, could you return? Maybe you just want to say, Lord, I want to rededicate my life. I want to renew my vow and my, ded my dedication and my consecration. I want to renew it right now. Could you raise a hand, young person? Every head bow. Don't be looking around. Say, Lord, it's my desire to serve you. It's my desire to live a separated life. Even the musicians, even you that are gathered up here today, maybe you want to raise a hand and say, Lord, that's my life. That's my desire. That's my prayer, Lord. And maybe I'm at that valley of decision, Lord, and let me make the right choice. Let me not just treat, let me not just go through life just aimlessly, just going down a pattern and going down, a, a, chasing a certain dream. Let me stop right now and say, Lord, I want to step onto the plan that you've called for my life. Grant it, Lord, every hand, every life, every heart that's lifted up to you right now, Jesus. You've called us to be different. And what makes us different, Lord? Nothing else but your spirit that dwells inside of us. Let it be, Jesus, fill our young people with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Fill them, Lord, if they've been filled, let them be refilled tonight, Jesus. Let them be refilled with a renewed vision. I spoke to men. Let that man realize his position, dominion, and take control and subdue his nature. Let me walk in the Spirit. Grant it, Lord, to my life. I raise my hands right now. Let me walk in the Spirit, Lord. Grant it, Jesus. Let us value your spirit. For, Lord, without that, your prophet said it's the lifeline, it's the bloodline, it's the lifeline of a church. It's what gives it life. We may not have much, Lord. We may, may be simple, simple people with simple faith. But that's who you choose, Lord. You don't choose the great things of life. You don't choose the grandeur, the glitter. You said the gospel, your prophet said it doesn't glitter, but it glows with the Holy Spirit. And Satan's got an entire Eden. There's people who live after that Eden. They can live off of it. They can, it can satisfy them. This world can satisfy them. Even the, even the, your prophet said even the hybrid church with her modernized, civilized, modernized, theological, educated, intellectual church, hybrid. And they can live off that. Maybe that's what gives them, maybe that's the purpose and the fulfillment of what you've called them to. But Lord, I raise my hands today and say, Lord, I don't need more intellect. I don't need more knowledge. I don't need more of that. What I need is more of your spirit, of that enabling power to come and dwell my vessel to give me power to live above sin, to overcome the enemy, to, 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 to overcome his snares and his traps that he's placed in my life. Fill us, Lord God, of your spirit, that ruach, that breath of God. Oh, could you stand to your feet, young people? Could you stand to your feet and raise your hand and say, Lord, breathe on me one more time, Jesus. Let your life breathe upon me, oh God. Let it flow, Jesus, through my body. Let it flow through my spirit. Let it cleanse my conscience and my memory, my imagination, my affection. Let it flow. As the song says, flow through me. What are you saying, Lord? Let your spirit, let your purpose, let your anointing, let it baptize my life so that I'm so filled up, I'm so emptied out of myself in the world that, God, you can come and fill me. You can come and fill me. Don't let me be like the house that was clean and swept, but not occupied, but let your presence occupy. Take residence in my heart, in my home, in my life, Jesus. Grant it, Lord. Grant it, Jesus, to every hand, every life. Lord, every prayer, every, every, Lord, every per young person that's here with hands raised, with voices speaking and crying out to you. Let it, Jesus, accomplish what you have intended for it to accomplish, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want to die to myself. I want to die to my passion. I want to die to my pride. I lay it down on the altar just now, Lord. I'm giving myself, as the song says, I'm giving myself away. That's my prayer, Lord.
truly my desire, Jesus. Oh, sing it to him. I can explain. I can't explain. Oh, with tongue or pain, the spirit's groanings deep within. I know it must, must be God, God here in my soul. feel the pull it will tug at your heart you'll never forget it but please don't ever pass it by don't ever let it go it may be your last time but God's pulling at your heart you need to answer to it you need to come let's sing that one more time as we let the ladies get ready downstairs um, for the meal our brother preached a wonderful sermon with all of us so let's just just for a few more minutes let's worship let's sing flow through me
Amen. All minds clear. We've got um, food to eat downstairs, and let's go down there and and enjoy a meal. We've enjoyed a spiritual meal up here. Let's go enjoy a natural meal, and then we'll get together with the youth and and have some maybe some questions and answers. But Luis has maybe some things, and the kids have something they're going to do. So let's just go downstairs and enjoy a meal, fellowship the rest of the time, and um, God bless you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for being here and participating. And uh, we pray that you just have a good time in the Lord. And we did it for you, and we want you to have a good time. So let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that you would, Lord, not just sanctify the food downstairs, but Lord, sanctify the people that are up here, Lord, that heard a wonderful sermon. Our brother poured his heart out, Lord, and it will not return void. It will accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish. Lord, I pray, though, that you do sanctify the food that we're about to eat. Lord, cleanse it. Lord, may it nourish our body, Lord, and may we have fellowship with you, Lord, and then now fellowship with each other, that the young adults and the kids will get together, Lord, and talk about you, Father. We thank you for the adults that's brought you, the people here, Lord, and we pray that you'd be with them, Lord, and take care of them. Be with each one, Lord, then as we leave and go on the highways, Lord, that you'll protect us. And give each one, Lord, a sanctifying shower tonight, Lord, and in the morning we can come to church, Lord, be rejuvenated for our brother to speak again to us, Lord. We pray that you just bless us now and take care of us in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.